Hi guys! In this video we're going to be looking at potential difference in parallel circuits, potential difference in parallel circuits with many components, and we're going to finish with a summary. So we're going to start off by looking at how the potential difference varies in parallel circuits. Parallel circuits have multiple closed loops providing pathways for current to flow through. So the difference between a parallel circuit and a series circuit is that a series circuit only provides one possible path for the current to go through. However, a parallel circuit has multiple paths, so that's what we're going to see here. So the current could go along this branch and down this path, so that's one way. Then the current could go along this branch here and then take that path or the current can go along this third branch and follow this path back to the cell. So we can see that we've got three different current loops here. So that's why this is a parallel circuit. It's got more than one pathway for the current to flow through. Each branch within a parallel circuit forms its own loop. So we've got two branches here. At this point we have a junction and the circuit splits off into two branches. So we've got branch one and then branch two this way. So the two branches provide two separate loops. So we've got one loop going via branch one this way. So that's loop one. And then we've got a second loop going via branch two. So this way here. So we'll call this loop two. So each branch provides its own loop. Kirchhoff's second law states that for any complete circuit loop, the sum of the EMFs round the loop is equal to the sum of the potential differences. So let's remind ourselves of Kirchhoff's second law. We say that the sum of the EMFs around a closed loop in a circuit is equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in that closed loop. So this is the sum of the EMFs in the closed loop, and then this is the sum of the potential differences in the closed loop. So that means we can treat each loop in our parallel circuit separately as one series circuit. The sum of the potential differences in each branch of a parallel circuit must therefore equal the total EMF. So we've said we've got loop one here from one branch, and then we've got loop 2 from the second branch in this parallel circuit. So if each loop here is a closed loop and it's its own closed loop that we consider, then we consider the potential differences within that loop separately. So we've got a potential difference V across this resistor and a potential V across this other resistor. So now if we were to apply Kirchhoff's second law to this circuit, we'd have to first apply it to loop 1 and then loop 2. So loop one, the total sum of the EMFs in this first loop must equal the total sum of the potential differences of the component in this loop. So in that loop, we've only got this component. So we'd only consider the potential difference across that component. Now let's have a look at loop two. So again, we consider the sum of the EMF in that loop. So in this case, the EMF provided is in loop one and loop two. So we've got the same EMF for both loops. And this EMF provided to the circuit must be equal to the sum of the potential differences in loop two. So in loop two, we'd consider this component, not this component. We only consider the components in that particular loop when we're adding together the potential differences. For example, in a circuit with only one cell, the sum of the potential differences for each loops simply equals the EMF of the cell. So if we're looking at loop one and we want to consider the sum of the EMFs in loop one, we need to consider our EMF source for this loop. So we've only got one EMF source in this circuit. We've just got this single cell. So that means the sum of the EMF for loop one is just going to be the EMF of this cell, which is E. And then this will be equal to the sum of the potential differences in that particular loop. So in this case, it's just the potential difference of this resistor. That's the only resistor in loop one. So now let's apply this to loop two as well. So let's think about the sum of the EMFs in loop two. 
Well, we can see that in this circuit, we've only got one cell providing the EMF for both loops. So this means that the EMF of loop two, the total EMF, is again just provided by this one cell. So it's actually got the same total EMF as loop one, which is E. They've both been provided with the same EMF from the cell. And again, the sum of the EMF in loop two will be equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in this loop. But again, in loop two, we've only got this one resistor to consider. So we only consider the components in that particular loop. So now let's try this out in an example. A circuit contains a cell with an EMF of 15 volts, as well as two resistors connected in parallel. The potential difference across the resistor in the first branch is 15 volts. What is the potential difference across the second resistor? So we've been told that this circuit contains one cell with an EMF of 15. So our EMF from this cell is 15 volts. And then we've got a parallel circuit with two loops and we've got a resistor in each loop. So the first resistor has a voltage of 15 volts. The second resistor has a potential difference that we don't know. And that's what we want to find out. Our first step is to write Kirchhoff's second law. So we know that for any closed loop in a circuit, the sum of the EMFs in that circuit is equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in that loop. Our second step is to apply Kirchhoff's second law to the branch containing the second resistor to get the potential difference across the second resistor in terms of the EMF of the cell. So the EMF of the cell is going to equal to the potential difference of resistor two. The EMF from the cell is just equal to the potential difference across the second resistor because we don't have any other components in that loop. And now our third step is to substitute the value for the EMF of the cell into the equation for the potential difference across the second resistor. So we've said that the potential difference across this second resistor V2 is going to be equal to the EMF of the cell which we've been told is 15 volts. So that means the potential difference across this resistor is just 15 volts. And we can see that this is the same as the other resistor connected in parallel. And if we look at our circuit closely, we can see why this is. So we've got one component in each loop and we've got one cell that's providing an EMF for both loops. So it makes sense that because the EMF is the same for both loops, if we've only got one resistor in each of the loops, the potential difference across both resistors will be the same because the potential difference across this component is going to be equal to the EMF of the cell, which is 15 volts. And then the potential difference across this component is again going to be equal to the EMF of the cell, which is again 15 volts. And that's because we've only got one cell here providing the EMF. So now that we understand how potential difference varies in a parallel circuit, let's have a look at the potential difference in a parallel circuit with many components. There are often many components connected on each branch in a parallel circuit. So for example, here we've got two branches. Our first branch has one component, but our second branch has multiple components. So we need to know how to deal with more than one component in our branch. In this case, Kirchhoff's second law still applies and the sum of the EMFs in any closed loop is equal to the sum of the potential differences across each component in the branch. So for example, here in this slightly more complicated circuit, we've got more components in one of the two branches, but we've still only got two branches. So we've got two loops. We've got loop one here, and then loop two here. So the EMF provided to each of these loops will be equal to the EMF of the cell. So a nice way of understanding and remembering how this works is to think that the cell provides an amount of energy to each charge carrier as it passes through the cell here. And this energy comes from the EMF. Then each charge carrier has this particular amount of energy. And as it passes through the circuit, it transfers this energy to the components. We've seen this before. 
But what happens at the branch is that some charge carriers go one way and some charge carriers go the other way. However, the total amount of energy that each charge carrier has doesn't change when they go through the different branches. They've all still got the same amount of energy provided to them from the cell. So that's why the sum of the potential differences in each loop are always equal to the EMF of the cell. Each individual charge carrier has the same energy provided to it from the cell. Then, when we have multiple components within that loop, the energy of the charge carrier might be split. So for example, in loop one here, we've only got one component. So each charge carrier will transfer all of its energy that it got from the cell to that particular component. Whereas in loop two, the charge carrier needs to split its energy between the two components because it needs energy to actually pass through them. So it needs some energy to pass through this first component, but then it still needs more energy to pass through the second component. So that's why in the second loop with multiple components, the charge carrier's energy is split between the two. So it transfers some energy to one and some energy to the other. However, the total energy transferred to the two components is still equal to the energy that the charge carrier originally obtained from the cell. So let's write this down. The sum of the EMFs in loop one is equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in loop one. So in this case, in loop one, we've just got the EMF from this cell and we've just got the potential difference across this resistor V1. So in this case, the EMF of the cell E is just going to be equal to V1. So like we said, in this case, all the energy that the charge carrier obtains from the cell is going to go to this component when it passes through it. However, let's look at loop two. So remember we said some charge carriers will go through loop two, some charge carriers go through loop one. So for loop two, again, the sum of the EMF in that loop is going to be equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in that loop. So again, the EMF for this loop is just given by the EMF of this cell. So the total EMF is just E. But if we look at the potential differences across these two re resistors, so we've got V2 and V3. So we now need to add these together to get the total sum of the potential differences. So we've got V2 plus V3. So we can see now how the energy that the charge carriers obtained is actually split between the two components when there's more than one component in a branch. Because remember, EMF is the energy transferred to the charge carriers per unit charge, and the potential difference is the energy transferred from the charge carrier to the component per unit charge. So this is still energy, it's just energy per unit charge. So now let's try and apply this to an example. A cell with an EMF of 10 volts is connected to three resistors in parallel. One resistor lies on the first branch, and the other two are connected through the second branch. The resistor in the first branch has a potential difference of 10 volts, and one of the resistors on the second branch has a potential difference of 3 volts. What is the potential difference of the final resistor? So we've been told that the EMF provided by the cell is equal to 10 volts. Then we've been told that the potential difference across one of the resistors in this second branch is three volts, we're gonna call this V1 is equal to three volts. We want to find the potential difference of the resistor in, of the other resistor in this branch, which we're gonna call V2. And we've also been told the potential difference across this other resistor in this first branch, which we're gonna call V3, and that is equal to 10 volts. So now let's move on to step one. Write Kirchhoff's second law. So we've said that for any closed loop in a circuit, the sum of the EMFs in that circuit are equal to the sum of the potential differences of the components in that loop. Our second step is to write Kirchhoff's second law for the second branch in terms of the components within the circuit by expanding the summation terms. So we need the total EMF in this circuit. So we've only got one cell in the circuit. We can see that in our diagram here. So we only need to worry about the EMF provided from that cell. So that's our total EMF, E cell. 
and then we saw that in this branch we have two resistors so to get the total potential difference in that branch we need to sum the potential differences across each of these resistors so we've got v1 plus v2 so now let's move on to step three rearrange the equation to make the potential difference across the unknown resistor the subject so the potential difference across the unknown resistor is v2 so we want to make v2 the subject so v2 is going to be equal to the emf of the cell minus the potential difference of the first resistor v1 and now our fourth step is to substitute values into the equation to calculate the potential difference across the unknown resistor. So V2, we said is equal to the EMF, which is 10 volts, minus the potential difference across the other resistor in that branch, which was 3 volts. So that means the potential difference of the second resistor is 7 volts. So we can see here that the sum of our potential differences of our resistors in that branch, if we look at it again, because we said V2 here is 7. And we can see that if we add 7 to 3, we get the EMF again, we get 10 volts, which comes from Kirchhoff's second law. And we can also see that in our other branch, the potential difference across that resistor is also equal to 10 volts, it's equal to the EMF. So we can see that the potential difference across each branch is equal to the EMF provided to the circuit. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level physics resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised smiley face and together let's make A-level physics a walk in the park.